Hi everybody, I'm Bill Fenders and this is Watch Art Sci, the art and science of, I almost said the art and science of Christmas Eve. <laughs> Not, it is, this, this particular video was released on Christmas Eve and if you celebrate Christmas, Merry Christmas. Uh, today, what I want to talk about is watch collection for the absolute beginner. And I mean, just really getting started. Uh, that's sort of two things. First of all, those with more experience can say, wait a minute, you should have told them this, you should have said this. So it's an opportunity for to, to have a discussion, we'll say. Okay, the very first thing I would tell a, somebody getting into watch collection is don't ever wind your watch on your wrist. The reason for that, you can bend the, uh, the stem on it. And if you bend the stem, you break it and you have to have your watch repaired and it can cost you a lot of money. Just take your watch off and just, you know, hold it like this and wind it up. I have a on a little uh, stand here that I use it for, but just wind it up with your hands. Simple thing. Okay. The second tip I have is you have a, if you start collecting watches, you, at some point you're going to get a case for your watches so you can, you can look at all of them. And in a watch case, they come with these little pillows, and you wrap the uh, band around the pillow. If you have a pin buckle, don't buckle it, because eventually the tip of the watch, will this will wear on the tip, and you know, the tip of the band, and it can, it'll, it'll eventually wear out a lot quicker. If you have a lot of watches and you rotate them, uh, there's no sense in having any of your pin buckles to have, the, have them uh, have them buckled, so just put them in loose. On the other hand, when you have a deployment uh, clasp uh, like this one, and a deployment in clasp, you they just pop open like that, and they don't really affect uh, what's going to happen, whether they're uh, open or closed. And so you can wrap those around the the pillow and then put them in there. There's a top view of a of a case with all the watches. Some of them are pin buckles, some of them are deployant. They all fit in there just fine. You don't have to buckle them up. Okay, that's my first advice. Okay, now the second thing is just sort of the, the terminology to choose for a watch dial or looking at a watch. Uh, the first thing at the top uh, and the bottom, you have what are called lugs, and the lugs are there for holding bands. The great majority of watches only have two lugs. And you put the, uh, slip the band in and you have a little spring bar and you slip the spring bar into the little holes and that holds on your watch. This particular one has three and to, to tell you the truth, I, I prefer ones with two. They're a lot easier to put the band on and off. The uh, hour numbers are simply the numbers on, on your watch. Your indexes, you have two types of indexes. Uh, one is for a five-minute index, and this particular watch, uh, there are these little triangles, and then you have the uh, minute indexes, and they're just little slash marks on there. The hour hand is the shorter of the two hands, and the minute hand is the longer of the two. That's nothing new. This, uh, your winding uh, head here is called the crown. Uh, this second hand in this particular case when you have a second hand that's not uh with the hour and a minute hand in other words if you have them all three of them here uh, it's called center seconds but when they're not center seconds they have a number of different names they're called the sub seconds small seconds eccentric seconds different names like that uh, and you have a subdial, and a subdial is simply any dial inside of the main dial if you have a chronograph you have several subdials uh, inside of it. This one has one small seconds. Okay, moving right along, uh, there are two basic types of mechanical movements. Uh, and these are basic types. There may be some strange ones, but I'm not going to talk about them. Uh, the most basic is hand wound. You just take it and you wind it up and you can see through the back and there's there's no nothing blocks the view of it and that's one reason i like hand wound on the other hand you have automatic and automatic movements have a 
rotor of some type that that swings around as you move in this particular one here uh the gold rotor 22 karat gold is 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 has a certain weight to it so the in some of them are bi-directional and some of them are monodirectional, depending on the watch. Most of them, I think, these days are bi-directional, so no matter how you move, the thing is working and winding the watch. The good thing about a having a, a, an automatic movement is that the body movement does all the winding, so you don't have to worry about winding it after a certain period of time. Uh, there are two really basic types of rotors. One is just called a rotor. The other one is called a micro rotor. On the bottom, uh, that one has a micro rotor. And you can see there's sort of little thatch uh, materials on the movement. That's where it is. That's this little, little micro rotor down there. This particular one's made of platinum. And it swings around like the bigger rotor. The difference is, is that with the micro rotor, you can see more of the movement. Uh, the watch can be thinner. You don't have to have a fat watch to stack on the other rotor. And uh, there, the downside is, is that you don't have as much room for the rest of the movement. You have to have relatively small uh, balance wheels and some other things, but everything's a trade-off on that. Finally, you have what's called a shape movement. And a shape movement is basically any movement that's not round. And they call it a shape movement because the the shape of the of the watch, a tonneau shape or a rectangle shape or something other than round, uh, the the movement is built for that kind of watch. So a lot of rectangular square watches and everything else have still have round um uh they have round movements in them, but uh, this particular one has a shape movement in it, and you can see it's somewhat like the tonneau shape of the of the watch itself. Okay, now this next thing is don't worry about understanding all of this right away. I'll just explain it, and and I have there's some other there are a few missing parts here, but this will I hope give you a, a sense of what a mechanical watch does. You have a mainspring barrel and you activate it or charge it by winding it up and so with a wound up barrel you have a, it's full of what we'll call tension and it's trying to relieve that tension and as it relieves it it will it's set up so that it turns the wheel or the mainspring barrel wheel and it has teeth on it that then will go through the going train and turn these other wheels too it actually doesn't turn them so much as it adds tension to them. And once you get down, you have the second wheel, the third wheel, the fourth wheel, and then at the green one at the end down there is called the escape wheel. And what escapes is they relieve tension. And when the tension is released, the wheels can move because none of those wheels can move even though they have all of the tension from the mainspring until the escape wheel lets it escape and then they and then they move. Now, this is set up, you have a pallet fork. Uh, this particular one is called a, I think it's called a Swiss lever pallet. And what it does, it goes like this. And then it, it with each rock on it, it really, it is able to move one tooth <laughs> amount of movement and so it's really it's going like this all the time and so it looks like everything is moving very smoothly and it usually is and the way it's able to do it it has this uh, what's called a hairspring or a balance spring and it is it's when the the tension from the mainspring kicks the pallet uh fork and that when that kicks it puts the uh, hairspring into what's called a semi-oscillation and it simply oscillates and then it pops back and when it pops back it's rocking the uh, uh, the pallet fork which is releasing uh, the escape wheel and that's how the time is done there's more to it than that but that's the basic of it and like I said if you don't understand all of that initially that's fine Okay, now, uh, so the next thing about watch is buying decision. There's, there's a price and a, and a type, okay? 
So the first thing you want to do, and this is very important for a collector, uh, is consider is a realistic affordability. Now consider the amount you can spend on a watch that you're going to enjoy. Don't don't buy a watch uh, that you won't enjoy. That doesn't make any sense. A lot of people do. Uh, <laughs> you never know who they can be. Anyway, uh, so that's that's sort of the first. And it's sort of saying, well, that sounds like common sense. But a lot of times, a lot of watch collectors don't have a lot of common sense, including myself sometimes. You get excited about a watch and go out and buy it. And, you know, that's that's watch collection. Okay, there are basic types of watches. A sports watch, and a sports watch can be, well, what's called a diver, a pilot's watch. A lot of chronographs are in a sport watch kind of thing. It, sports watch is the kind of watch you can sort of bang around in and go out and play and not have to worry about it too much. Second type is what I call an office watch. An office watch is just a, a very practical watch that is it's not ostentatious it's for like telling time and you can glance at your wrist and it's sort of a nice thing to have in an office or you know you can either that or look at your <laughs> your iphone whatever but usually an office watch is simply a practical simple practical watch this particular one that i have here is a uh, jazza lacoutre uh, master one of their master models by the way the sports watch example was an omega uh, c masters they have a lot of different kinds so that's but these are sort of general categories travel watches is, is a watch that a lot of times uh, business uh, if you travel a lot in business or for whatever reason uh, you're going to be going through different time zones and it's really handy to have a travel watch where you can look at different time zones um this particular one shown as a mont blanc and it has called a world timer because you can look at it and see what time it is where you are and then different parts of the world that you're in the final type is a dress watch and a dress watch is usually made of precious metal gold platinum something like that uh, they tend to be very thin and the classic uh, dress watches, hour and minute hand only. Uh, first watch I bought uh, when I started collecting watches was the Patek Philippe Calatrava. Uh, it was an older one, but it was a wonderful watch. It just was like winding up jewels in it. But people told me, said, you know, that's not one you can bang around with at work or out and goofing around. That's for special occasions. And so I, I didn't realize that. <laughs> I thought, well, I could wear this anywhere. And uh, so I got a I got a, a, a sports watch. So, you know, for that, there's there are different kinds. I got a luxury sports watch uh, called an Overseas by Vassaron Constantin. They have them by um, uh, uh, Audemars Piguet has Royal Oaks, the great luxury sports watch. Uh, Patek Philippe has uh, Aqua manners like that but there there are there are a lot of different ones so a sports watch is not always a sports watch okay so in watch buying decisions the first two things are realistic affordability and the type of watch now uh this last thing i want to talk about is watch buying decision this is all research and place you buy it research and compare i pointed out that if you want to see a fool in the mirror, don't do any research and don't compare. You see a watch for sale, you say, oh boy, I'm going to get that and, you know, pay the guy the money. And then you find out you paid too much. You got the wrong kind of watch and so forth. Always, 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 always do your research. Find out about a watch. Find out about the movement. Find out about the company. Find out everything you can. You'd be spending thousands of dollars. I mean, you might as well, you know, flush it down a rat hole if you're, if you're not going to do the research and compare it. That's really important. Okay, where to buy? Now, there's several choices. Um, the first one I have is called escrowed fund. By the way, too, a lot of the, so much of the buying and selling of watches is done online. I mean, uh, and especially if you're in a rural area, you're out in the middle of nowhere and uh, your watch store doesn't have a whole lot to offer and at the jewelry store uh you're going to go online you're going to find anywhere in the world you can buy watches and so now if you do that you want to get into a place that's going to escrow the funds 
uh, until the watch is approved. Uh, there's a place called Chrono 24. It does that. Uh, there's some charge for it, but it's, uh, believe me, it's well worth it. I once bought a watch in Poland, and the guy there uh, couldn't deliver it because it was in the middle of the pandemic or the early part of the pandemic, and somehow the watch couldn't leave the country. So anyway, he, you know, he, he got his watch back. I got my money back, and we're both happy with it. But, you know, that's why escrow is important. Uh, and, of course, if somebody's trying to sell you a phony watch, that's another reason. The second is... Uh, it's, I, I call it a authentic, authentication that's prior to releasing the funds, somebody looks at the watch and says, this is what they said they're selling you. So if I want to buy a Rolex and the guy says, hey, wait a minute, this is a piece of junk. It's not a real Rolex. It's a phony. It's a fake. You know, the auth authentication process will keep keep me from getting burned. In other words, they're not going to release the fund until it goes through authentication. eBay has a great, great deal on that. Authentication, I bought two watches to their authentication, and both of them were a little more sophisticated kind of watch, so it's going to take somebody who knows their stuff, and apparently they did. Got two great watches that day. Another thing I talk about is the secondary market. What is What is it? The secondary market uh, is often called the gray market, and there's so many myths about it. I think a gray market is a sort of a negative term. It's not quite legal in it, but it's not black market. It's a secondary market. Most of the watches, if you go out on the secondary market to buy a brand new watch, and it's highly discounted, people figure, oh, wait a minute, that's too good of a deal. Well, in this case, no. When a watch company can't sell all of its watches through its boutiques or its authorized dealers, got to sell them somewhere. And so it goes to the secondary market. And from the secondary market, you usually get less of a warranty and guarantee and so on and so forth. But you also get a big price break. Uh, some of my favorite ones are a place called Joma Shop. Uh, let's see, another place called Shopborn. A lot of their prices are great. Other ones are, you know, sort of like, almost like a uh, going into a regular store, like um, a Del Rey watches. Uh, there's a guy named Federico who has a he has a, a YouTube show too, and he's got in there. You can see all kinds of watches there, and he has both really great discounts and ones that are not so much discounted. Anyway, uh, so that's another thing. When you're talking about secondary market. It's not a gray market. They, they really are needed by the watch companies. Authorized dealers, paper, warranty boxes, a lot of security. I don't know. I just had a friend who, who got burned by an authorized dealer, and he put some money down and so forth, and, and the guy sold the watch that he ordered to someone else because I think he was able to get more money from it. There, so authorized dealers, I think, are important. I bought probably of all my watches. I can think of one that I got from an authorized dealer, got a great buy on it. It really worked out well. Uh, but they're not the, a lot, uh, they're not, notice they're not my first choice <laughs> by a long shot. Okay, auction. Uh, this can be great. You got to know what you're doing if you're going to an auction. When you buy a watch, they have what's called a hammer price. And so let's say I, I bid, uh, I get a watch and I pay, uh, let's say $5,000, $4,000 for it, okay? Then I got to pay another 25%. So if I, if I end up with a winning bid called the hammer price of $4,000, I've got to add another 1000 to it or 25% of that 4000 So I pay 5000 for it. Now, if nobody else is bidding on it, and, and this happens, you can no one's interested or they don't want to, you know, fight you on a bid, uh, you can get some really great prices at even adding that 25%. Uh, a lot of times you can find washers you won't find anyplace else on an auction. So, but you really better do your homework on an auction. Do all your research, find out what the what you can get the same watch for. Because some I've seen people pay like two and three times as much for a watch as they could just, you know, pick up at a store or online. So do your homework for auctions. The trade and sell groups. 
Uh, these are groups of collectors who sort of have these organizations, and I, I belong to one online, but you got to know, you need to know who you're dealing with. Okay, international sales. I bought watches from Switzerland, Germany, the Netherlands, and, and people in Europe have bought them from the United States back and forth. What you, the big thing about international is that uh, one of the things that you have to deal with was called sites. And sites is really a good thing, but it can be a pain in the neck. Uh, if you buy a, a gator or a crocodile um, band, it has to be from a gator farm. In other words, they have to be a farmed gator. Uh, and that's as opposed to ones that are almost extinct. And this is what Sites is trying to stop or stop ivory killing elephants and a lot of things like that. It's not a bad thing though, but you gotta know what you're doing with, with Sites. And you need Sites papers. Usually if I buy overseas, I just tell them, put a leather one on it and forget about the about the other one. You have to know about custom because coming into your country, some countries, have a big VAT on things in addition to customs. Uh, for example, Canada, I think, has like, <coughs> excuse me, a 20% VAT. So you've got to know about those things. Uh, if you're in the United States, they have very, very low customs charges, and the taxes would be the taxes you'd pay whatever state you're in. Okay, now that's just a, that's a starter. That's for a brand new uh, watch collector. And uh, for experienced watch collectors, I'm sure you've got tons of things to add and correct on whatever I said. But anyway, again, I'm wishing everyone a, uh, a happy Christmas and a happy new year. And um, until next time, this is Bill Sanders for Watch Art Side, the art and science of watch collection. This is an invitation to subscribe if you'd like. And I really do like to hear your comments. Let me hear what you think and any advice you can give me too. Take care.